FX Medicine is your gateway to resources, research and information on the safe, evidence-based approach to practising complementary and integrative medicine. Stay current by visiting fxmedicine.com.au to register for our email newsletter and exclusive members-only content. Welcome to FX Medicine, bringing you the latest in evidence-based, integrative, functional and complementary medicine. I'm Dr. Michelle Woolhouse. FX Medicine acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, where we live and work, and their connection to land, sea, and community. We pay our respects to the elders, past and present, and extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women, and the incidence is rising. One in eight Australian women will be diagnosed in their lifetime. Most of us listening to this show will know at least one loved one or friend who has been or is going through the condition. But are we doing enough for prevention? Joining us today is my colleague and friend, Dr. Nicole Nelson. She's an integrative medicine GP working out of the Sunshine Coast, and she's a faculty member of ACNAM, the Australian College of Nutrition and Environmental Medicine, and teaches doctors and health practitioners nutritional and environmental medicine. She's also an author of two ebooks, one on healthy eating called Pure Sweetness and the other on fasting. Welcome to FX Medicine, Nicole. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. So what was really apparent to me as a student of medicine, and I'm sure it was to you in those early days, was that breast cancer risk was often espoused as things you couldn't do much about. There was often talk about the BRCA gene and family history and timing of your period and menopause. But there's so many more other really evidence-based modifiable risk factors at play. Tell us about that. What can we do? So it's very (laughs) exciting to find out that there are actually some active things that we can do and some things that we can avoid to help prevent breast cancer. So, Mm. I mean, obviously we know about those non-modifiable risk factors like your age, so three quarters of breast cancers occur in women over 50. You've mentioned the BRCA genes. Family history is only, so nine out of 10 women diagnosed with breast cancer have no family history. Mm. Um, Obviously, you can plan your pregnancies before age 30 and breastfeeding is also protective for breast cancer. So that's something you can potentially modify and paying Mm. and, you know, making sure women are supported to breastfeed because a lot of times, and and not all times, there are some times when a woman just cannot breastfeed. But I Mm. think if we had more support available for women, that more women would be able to do that. And that does reduce your risk of breast cancer. But ones that don't get talked about a lot, things like exercise, uh, Mm. alcohol consumption, knowing your breast density, And then Mm. other ones that we probably should look into more is reducing our endocrine disruptor exposure, which we can discuss a bit more, knowing how to help our body excrete and appropriately process our estrogen. Mm. Uh, So those things are things that we can actually modify. Fantastic. You know, I I think we often kind of talk about breast cancer prevention is really early screening. So it's like, it's all about mammograms and picking it up early. We don't really talk so much about proper prevention, like how do we actually prevent it starting in the first place? So there's some really good ideas, particularly about alcohol consumption, because alcohol is is increased so much in women, particularly over the last decade. Yes, yes. And the sad thing about the alcohol consumption is there is a dose-dependent correlation in any alcohol whatsoever is associated with breast cancer. So there isn't actually a safe level. And I think, you know, in the media, we talk about safe levels of alcohol consumption and making sure we don't go over two standard drinks a day and that we have two alcohol-free days. But I think a lot of women would probably change their habits. And it's not that they would never touch alcohol at all. Some would choose that. But a lot of women would reduce their alcohol consumption even more if they knew 
what a risk factor that was. And it isn't really talked about. No, I know. And it's almost like it's talked about at safe levels for men. I mean, of course, women get involved with it, but women particularly have a strong sensitivity to alcohol and the the negative ramifications of that from cancer perspective and other other issues as well. Yes. So let's break it down a little bit more. You you kind of mentioned estrogen detoxification, which has so many different parts, obviously, from you know, how much we produce to to how it gets detoxified in the liver and the gut. So what's going on? Let's talk a little bit more detail and drill down into estrogen detoxification and how does a woman know or how do we pick that up if they've got problems with estrogen detox? Mm, well, sadly, in orthodox medicine, it isn't really discussed or tested But in the scientific literature, they've actually found that there can be many factors affecting how we detox estrogen and whether we do it in a a safe way and whether we produce toxic metabolites of estrogen that can predispose to cancer, but also uh, other issues like endometriosis. So it's in the scientific literature, but it hasn't Mm. reached clinical practice. And some of the things that affect estrogen metabolism are our diet. So There's a lot of different foods, uh, fibres, foods that have certain compounds, one of them being indole-3-carbonyl, which is found in Mm. cruciferous vegetables, so broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage. So there's certain vegetables that can change the way we detox estrogen. Obviously, our diet affects our gut microbiota. So the bacteria in our gut is affected by our diet and our gut bacteria play a big role in how estrogen is detoxified. So the healthier our gut is, the more safely we will be able to excrete and eliminate excess estrogen that the body is trying to get rid of. Conversely, if our gut isn't healthy, we may end up accidentally reabsorbing estrogen that the body's trying to get rid of via Mm. some beta-glucuronidase activity in the gut. So beta-glucuronidase is involved in whether or not we excrete or don't excrete uh, estrogen. And some women have uh, higher levels of this enzyme, beta-glucuronidase, which means that the estrogen that's trying to be excreted gets cleaved off and gets reabsorbed. So anything Mm. we can do to affect that system The other thing is just good excretion. So making sure a woman's bowels are going really well each day, but also making sure that other elimination uh, mechanisms like through our sweat, so that involves things like exercise and sauna, but also good hydration so that we can metabolise through our kidney. And then the other huge thing is uh, reducing and, and looking at how we excrete endocrine disruptors. Yeah, I'm going to get on to that, hold that thought for a sec. But I just wanted to to also break it down, like from a practitioner's perspective. I mean, obviously, you know, we know about PMT and problems with perimenopause and those kind of things. But when people have got issues with estrogen detoxification, they can show that up in so many different ways. In your clinical practice, what are the most common things that you see when somebody's having problems with that detoxification of estrogen? Yes, yeah, so that. Really, uh, you see it with a lot of hormonal issues. So you'll see a woman having breast tenderness, women who are predisposed to premenstrual tension, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. That can be, it it isn't always, but it can be a sign of um, a woman who's estrogen dominant, uh, women who have signs or diagnosis of endometriosis. So they're probably the most common things. Mm. And probably the thing that affects women the most is when it's disturbing the menstrual cycle. So when they've got terrible pain associated with that or when it's affecting mood. So probably the most common thing is when women have their mood and irritability affected. And so the liver detoxification capacity, like phase one and phase two, are very important for estrogen detoxification as well. Let's talk a little bit about that because, I mean, that can sometimes be a really big issue for some women, perhaps maybe Gilbert syndrome or or other factors that impact the ability of that estrogen detoxification. Yes. So when we're looking at uh, phase one, obviously things like calcium deglucurate have been shown to be helpful. 
and that can be taken orally. With phase two detoxification, we can take agents like DIM, but there are also uh, nutraceuticals that affect that because obviously we've got to look at also our methylation and how well our, our body is detoxifying in general. So mm. anything that we can do to support the liver so that, you know, we know of various agents. There's things like milk thistle and globe artichoke for, for bile flow. But often a lot of nutraceuticals are needed in that for liver support and, the, and supporting those enzymes in detoxification. So mm. making sure we've optimised B vitamins, making sure zinc is optimised, and then antioxidants and liver support, things like selenium are also important. So, you know, if we're looking specifically at what are our big things for phase one and phase three, it'd be calcium deglucurate. Phase two would be DIM. And then phase three is keeping your bowels moving. And so mm. the most important thing, we can look at all these nutraceuticals and, and look at agents to try and help, but none of that is going to work unless we've got really good, regular, healthy bowel motions. So it really comes down to that basics when we're really talking about prevention because I think sometimes like women are like, oh, I've got this either a breast cancer gene or a family history of breast cancer, which doesn't necessarily, as you said, associate with an increased risk per se. Like we, we know in the literature, I mean, in clinical practice or in real life medicine, it doesn't necessarily work that way. But some people are really concerned about their risk of breast cancer. And so these simple things can be so important. So with genetics, you know, we talk about the BRCA gene, which is not not as common as people actually recognise. And, and a lot of women go down gene pathways to find out their risk. Do you do any testing for genes? And how does this work in particular relationship with breast cancer? Yes. So what I tend to do with my patients is if there is a family history of breast cancer, often it has been done, but occasionally you will get a woman whose mother may have passed away before this technology was available or a, a, another family member may have passed away before the technology is available. So I'll often refer to a genetic counsellor to, mm. to discuss that with them because obviously there's that risk that the trauma of finding out that you have this potential increased risk of breast cancer. So for some women, it's like, great, that's going to change my life. Now I know that I need to work on these risk factors. I need to get more serious about exercise. I need to get more serious about my alcohol consumption and, and you know, other things that we know that contribute to a healthy lifestyle. But for those women that do want to know, uh, it's about one in eight breast cancers that do have any genetic predispositions. But yeah, I would refer to a genetic counsellor to talk more about that and find out about that risk. And the implication with that is that particularly with the BRCA genes and some of the other genes, there are associations with other cancers, for example, ovarian cancers. So mm. in a woman who comes up as a high risk with those genes, there then is the possibility of whether they would do prophylactic surgery, so bilateral mastectomy or oophorectomy, removing the ovaries and removing mm. that breast tissue to try and reduce the risk. Yeah, it's a really complex scenario. So our audience that's listening to this all over diet and the importance of diet for prevention and disease modifications, but the dietary advice for breast cancer prevention is is really kind of unclear in the literature. So we know epidemiologically some breast cancer incidence is vastly different across the world. And certainly in the Western world, we're seeing a significant rise. Tell us why there's so much confusion about this. And is there any patterns we can ascertain from these epidemiological or observational studies in terms of helping practitioners kind of really drill down and define what is the best diet from a prevention perspective? Mm, it is really tricky. And, and what's made it quite confusing is there's, you know, and we, we have this debate in natural medicine at the moment over being more vegan versus the, the carnivore keto movement that's higher in protein. And what's made it confusing is that one of the lowest incidences of breast cancer in the world is actually in Mongolia, which mm. appears to have a really high meat and dairy product diet. So, <laughs> so, um, so that's sort of quite <laughs> confounding. So that goes against some of the other studies that we've seen that talk about, you know, more vegetables in preventing breast cancer. There is talk about dietary fat being an issue. And mm. I think at the end of the day, 
one of the things we need to look at is your genetic history. So a lot of people, for example, if they are of certain Asian country, for example, China, and then we move them into a more Western diet, people seem to do better following their genetic diet that they've that yeah. they've traditionally followed or that is in their family. So that's one thing to consider about going back to what is in your genetic history and the more it, diet that's indigenous to the country that you've come from. The other thing we know in general is that more the Mediterranean diet is fairly mm. healthy where we're focusing on polyphenols and you know, good oils, avoiding those toxic inflammatory seed oils. So we don't have specific incidences with breast cancer, but we know that seed oils, for example, canola, sunflower, that they are inflammatory and we know that inflammation and cancer go together. And the mm. other thing is the big thing that I think is the most overruling. So whether you're a, a vegan or whether you're are an omnivore and you're following a Mediterranean diet or whether you're doing keto or carnivore, the big thing is that insulin is a tumour growth factor. So one thing that every group it. agrees mm. on is that we need to lower our sugar and, and keep our refined carbohydrates low. And so mm. many types of cancer have extra insulin receptors, making them respond more than normal to insulin's ability to promote growth. And so mm. one thing we can agree on is that we need to keep that to a minimum. And that's another thing that just isn't talked about. And unfortunately, when people turn up for cancer treatment, it's those foods that we have that incredible research on with insulin and glucose stimulating and really firing up cancer growth. It's those foods that people are fed while they're receiving treatment. Mm. Metabolic health is a really interesting point. And I think the more that I kind of research into, I guess, that as an umbrella form for, for patients makes it a, a lot easier to actually kind of shape the dietary advice. So it becomes less about the types of foods, but actually about how your body is responding to that. And given Absolutely. the particular role of, of insulin in cancer proliferation, what can we advise our patients in regarding to kind of lowering that key driver of, of insulin? Yeah. So one of the most powerful things is diet. So, mm. you know, being really mindful that every time we eat, so even if we're eating as healthy as we can, we do stimulate insulin. So trying to choose foods that give a lower and more sustained insulin response rather than spiking and causing high insulin. And so... Mm. It can be the types of foods you eat, but there's also intermittent fasting can play a role in this. So there's a lot of research coming out now about the role of, of having small eating windows, like six to eight hours where you eat in a six to eight hour window and fast for the remaining amount of time, which does seem to, despite what type of food you eat in that window, does seem to actually help reduce your insulin response. And I think it's just learning, like I, I don't think we need to deprive ourselves and that's why I wrote the Keto um, and Low Sugar Cookbook because I think there are sugar alternatives and ways to reduce sugar that we can still have treats and enjoy it. But unfortunately, it's taken a lot of time for that to start to show up commercially and, and to, to be seen in cafes and things. So I think we need to change our culture and realise that sugar is meant to be just a sometimes food treat. Unfortunately, it's just being put into commercial foods in such high amounts that people don't actually realise how much they're eating. Yeah, so no, I think a, more education around that is needed to be able to choose. And I was horrified myself when I first started looking into this about well, 15, 20 years ago when I actually looked at what I was eating because I thought I was a low-sugar person. And once I started mm. looking at labels, all the savoury foods that I loved, all the especially I, lo I love a lot of Thai and Chinese foods and the amount of sugar that was in the savoury foods was quite horrific. And I, I had I no know, idea yeah. that I was having such a high-sugar diet. It may be reason why sort of Mongolia was so significantly deficient as well. I mean, they're nomads and they're often, I think it's the highest country in the world that don't live in a city-based environment, so they're less sedentary, et cetera. You mentioned also estrogen disruptors. So over the last, what, 50 years or whatever, it's just, you know, year upon year, just more and more exposure to these really toxic 
estrogen disrupting chemicals that affect not just human health, but animal health and the health of the soil. And they're at ubiquitous levels. So very few people can avoid them completely, you know, from takeaway coffee cups to petrol receipts to wrapping food in glad wrap, all of that kind of stuff. Let's break this down because I know you're particularly passionate about estrogen disrupting chemicals and how we can best teach patients about this I guess without kind of freaking them <laughs> freaking them out really. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it is that balance of, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, everything causes cancer, so I can't do anything. But I actually do believe that there are some things that we can do to reduce our risk. And the, the problem with endocrine disruptors is that they affect the transport and breakdown of, of estrogen. They act on receptors to bind or block at the receptor level, they affect our endocrine and sex organ development in the in the womb. And the first mm. 10 days of embryogenesis is the most sensitive time that endocrine disruptors can have their effect. And what can happen is those first 10 days of that embryo developing can actually decide your risk of breast cancer, of endometriosis, of prostate cancer for men. And so, uh, you know, I think this is something that's been ignored and Mm. the people just aren't aware of. So probably the most passionate time, the people that I love educating the most about this are people who are planning on a pregnancy. Mm, But in terms of things we can do, it's some of those things you mentioned. So unfortunately, a lot of these endocrine disruptors have been allowed into commercial products. And one of the, the most common ones is actually aluminium, which is in deodorant. It's also alfoil, but it's also used a lot in industry. And you can't avoid aluminium. Even Mm. if you avoided all the known sources, you would still have aluminium in your body because it is used throughout industry. And once we get these heavy metals in our body, it's actually very hard to get rid of them. So someone might have a high aluminium who's been avoiding aluminium for many years. So buying a natural deodorant that doesn't have aluminium, being careful with coffee pods. So coffee pods with aluminium, not only are are we heating up plastic because the pods Mm. are made out of plastic, but we're heating up that aluminium foil that seals it. We can move to stainless steel coffee pods instead, or we can just make our own coffee with beans. Um, Being careful of what you put on your feet. Your feet is one of the most areas of your body that absorbs the most. And so Mm. making sure you're not bathing your feet in plastic, so trying to wear cotton socks if you can, having leather liners. When you get into your car, when it's been a hot day and you get into your car, the plastics in your car that are released just from the car heating up, it's a very toxic place. So if you can just, you know, spend a couple of minutes just, winding the windows down and airing it out. And the other thing that our building biologist colleagues would say is making sure your home has adequate ventilation because all of this fake furniture that we have now, just so much plastic used in in carpets and in our furniture and on all the glues and things that are used in the home, if we can ventilate our home really well, that's important as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, they always talk about indoor air pollution being more toxic than external air pollution, but that um, message hasn't really been driven home. What about substances such as phthalates? Tell us a little bit about their impact on breast cancer and where we find them and what we do about them and are they such a big problem? Yes, so absolutely. Phthalates are found in plastics but also found in carpets and furniture and What we find is that because they're known to be carcinogens and Mm. they've actually done studies in animals induced tumours by providing, you know, phthalates to in the studies and the incidence of mammary tumours in rodents when when also their offspring were challenged with other carcinogens. So it can be that you are exposed to a phthalate in childhood and then later in life another carcinogen has a bigger effect because you were exposed to a phthalate earlier in life. So it can sort of prime you Mm. for other carcinogens. And so the important thing is to, one, know how to avoid these things. So, you know, Mm. we talked about plastics, also cosmetics. We have to be careful with what we put on our skin. So that's why people say don't put anything on your skin that you wouldn't eat. 
But yes. um, what we need to do is not just avoid them, but know what we can do to detox these things out of our body. And mm. some some of the nutraceutical companies have come up with some really good supports for detoxification. So you can actually, from some of the nutraceutical companies, buy nutrient agents that try to help you detoxify. But in terms mm. of what we can do, sauna is huge. So they've done studies with sauna where they looked at blood, sweat, and urine levels of some of these endocrine disruptors, including phthalates. And what they found was that some of these things only came out through sweat in a sauna. And so that's really interesting. So some of them weren't showing up detoxifying in the urine and didn't necessarily show up in the blood samples, but came out in sweat. So, Mm. you know, obviously exercise because it helps with lymphatic drainage. So Mm. anything we can do that helps the lymphatic system, anything we can do to sweat. But sweating with sauna sweats you in a way that just exercising or living in a hot climate, it does it in a different way and seems Mm. to get rid of these chemicals in a different way. Wow, it's such a fantastic advice that we can kind of give to patients like because, you know, they're pleasant, you know, saunas are pleasant and a really nice way to relax as well. But I wanted to to drill down into, we know one of the key strategies in mainstream medicine is for early detection using breast imaging. But a lot of my patients come and they've got significant breast density and that is now recognised an independent risk factor for breast cancer. One, you know, I guess we can't inherently do much about. But what is the clinical advice that we can give, you know, to women to further highlight, I guess, the preventative necessity if breast density becomes a problem in those early detection slash screening slash mammogram situations? Mm. So about two third of women in their 40s have dense breast tissue and up to a third of these women will retain that into menopause. And the Mm. problem with that is that it is an independent risk factor in itself, as you mentioned, for breast cancer, and it makes it harder to read a mammogram. And so Mm. what's starting to happen in the US is it's become mandatory for women to be notified of what classification they have with in terms of breast density, and they are to be notified if they have dense breasts. This is starting to happen. So some of the radiology centres in Australia are starting to report that. And so Mm. what I do, if I get a mammogram back, even if it's normal, obviously we'll, we'll call the patient back in, but we won't alarm them that they've got anything wrong on their mammogram. But we'll just have a discussion around the things that we've talked about today, that they've got this independent risk factor for breast cancer and the kinds of things that they can try and do and also have some discussions around imaging. Yeah, excellent. And also I wanted to kind of look beyond early detection because I think in medicine, you know, as we know, we think about prevention as early screening, which really isn't prevention at all. What can we do in terms of nutritional support that is kind of more more proactive in many ways that individuals can do to support their breast health? So So ideally, we would have certain nutrients tested. So our immune nutrients, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, iron, iodine and zinc. And, you know, there's others like selenium that are important. So we'd make sure in an ideal world that we had adequate levels. There is some low level evidence around vitamin A decreasing the risk of breast cancer, also Mm. ovarian and cervical cancer. It is low level, but still that's something for me that I'd want to make sure that I have adequate vitamin A. The other thing is, you know, trying to make sure that we avoid those endocrine disruptors in our food. So trying to have food as organic as we can. Mm. I also discuss those certain nutrients like calcium deglucurate and um, DIM that we can potentially use to help modify the way estrogens detoxified. And ideally, we would have our cytochrome P450 enzymes and polymorphisms that affect estrogen metabolism tested. But, mm. you know, that is still, it's sort of emerging science and, and still in the realm of orthodox medicine is considered a bit Star Trek. We can also have <laughs> our saliva, serum and urinary estrogen metabolites tested to see what's happening there. Again, you know, that's being done in laboratories. We do have access to that, and but again, it's considered emerging. So it would be great if that, if there was more research around that and that was more accessible to women. It's mm. also very expensive to get some of that testing done, but it's a cost that some women, if they knew it was available, 
would be willing to have, and a lot of your listeners are actually already prescribing these kinds of tests to try and help mm. determine what kind of metabolites a woman might be and whether she's pushing her estrogen down a toxic pathway and looking at where they can intervene with these medicines. But it mm. sort of hasn't become mainstream, which is unfortunate. The other thing is looking at your gut beta-glucuronidase activity, and there are some labs that are actually looking at that and doing gut testing and actually reporting on whether that's something that you need to improve on in your gut in order to metabolise and safely excrete estrogen out of your bowel. So there's a lot we can do, but it's still considered emerging. But I think it's important for women who would like to have those things done to be informed about those alternative tests that can be done. Mm. Well, you mentioned iodine and you mentioned vitamin A and vitamin D as a as really key players from a nutritional perspective. You know, in particular, vitamin D deficiency is a, a major issue across the board. And as is vitamin A. In fact, I think the Australian Bureau of Statistics a couple of years back mentioned that about 90% of people are not reaching their vitamin A on a daily basis. I mean, obviously we can get it from beta carotene, you know, as well, but pure vitamin A is in short supply. So tell us what, what foods should we be aiming for and how do we best get these nutrients up to optimal levels? Mm. So the interesting thing about vitamin A is that we do, as you said, get a, most of our sources of vitamin A through beta carotene being converted into active vitamin A. But about 40% of women in the studies show that they may have a gene polymorphism that stops mm. the conversion of beta carotene into vitamin A. And there are various factors that can interfere with that, including our gut health. So probably the purest source is a non-vegan source, which is liver. And mm. in this modern world, we've gotten out of the habit of having offal, whereas in the olden days, the animal was eaten. There was no waste and organs were eaten mm. as well. And vitamin A is found in ready supply in the liver. But in terms mm. of beta carotene sources, it's really interesting because in the media, people talk about carrots, but carrots actually aren't the highest. So if you're trying to get the best source of beta carotene, it's actually sweet potato. Mm. So sweet potato followed by pumpkin. And I think carrot is actually further down the list. So right. with that, because it is a fat soluble vitamin, when you're having your beta carotene sources provided you can actually convert that into active vitamin A, it's a good idea to have some kind of fat with it. So, you know, eating avocado or having some olive oil with your sweet potato can actually mm, help the delicious. absorption <laughs> and conversion. Mm, nice. And then moving on to iodine, our best sources are seaweed. So anything from the sea, basically. So seaweed is a great source. And what I do is I, I have a salt that I actually mix seaweed into. And I try to make that like my source that I will use for iodine. And mm. so just always thinking, how can I add that into meals? It's interesting in Japan that have the very high seafood and seaweed intake due to the higher iodine and selenium found in their diet. They actually have a much lower, traditionally have a much lower breast and prostate cancer incidence. So there does mm. seem to be some association. We know that breast tissue has a lot of iodine receptors. It's always been said with breastfeeding in, in a lot of ancient cultures that if a woman's having trouble lactating, that she should have some fish or have some seaweed. And so it's, mm. it's been known traditionally that these sources of iodine actually are needed, for example, to breastfeed. So the breasts yeah, have a rich source of iodine. And so making sure that we have adequate iodine in the diet is really important. And mm. the other thing is that it can be tested. So we have to be careful. The spot urine iodine testing can vary. And so it's important to make sure that we do that test properly, that we avoid seafood and iodine three days before the test, that we um, appropriately fast before that and make that a morning spot urine iodine. But that's mm. one of the measures that has been looked at to look at population iodine levels. And that's something that we can do to actually test for iodine. And what about, I mean, obviously, you know, stress is very ubiquitous and, but also sedentary 
issues are a big problem, as is sleep. So they're the more kind of emotional and lifestyle factors. What should we be telling patients about that in terms of prevention from, from a breast cancer point of view? Yeah, so it's really interesting with exercise. There was actually a, a meta-analysis done in 2010 that looked at women who had been through a breast cancer diagnosis and it was found that exercise Women who uh, were previously, before their diagnosis, were exercising regularly had um, much better outcomes post-breast cancer. So when they were looking at the survival outcomes in breast cancer, they found that women who were regularly exercising after diagnosis had a 34% lower risk of breast cancer death. Uh, They Mm. also had a 41% lower risk of death from any cause and had a 24% lower risk of breast cancer recurrence than inactive women. And Mm. there's been various studies looking at, well, how much should we be doing? What what does that look like? And any amount of exercise has been, even just an hour a week, has been shown to be helpful. But the consensus Mm. seems to be about 30 minutes of moderate exercise most days. And so that means that you're actually a bit out of breath. You're struggling to have a conversation. So it's not just going for a gentle walk. You actually have to get your heart rate up and be a little bit out of breath. Yeah, great. It's such good advice. I mean, it's across the board, obviously. We know exercise decreases all-cause mortality, but there seems to be something particular about breast cancer. So that's, that's fantastic. And what about sleep? Because I know the women that I speak to in clinic are like, I don't know, 50% of them just got poor sleep. I mean, it's almost ubiquitous and they even forget to kind of tell you about it. So what role does sleep play in breast cancer prevention? Mm, You've hit the nail on the head there being one of the most important things because when we look at inflammation, which is the driver of all disease, but particularly Mm. uh, cancer as well, if we don't get enough sleep, we are more likely to be inflamed and also have neuroinflammation, which really affects our ability to be able to look after ourselves. So yeah. that's probably one of the first things I screen with my patients and one of the first things I address. And interestingly, exercise helps with sleep quality. Yeah, of course, but yeah, there are, There are some things that people don't realise. For example, one of the biggest things is caffeine. So people have this idea that caffeine is safe and that having one cup of coffee or two cups, as long as I have it early in the morning, won't affect my sleep. But again, looking at uh, gene polymorphisms and, you know, individual variations in how we metabolise caffeine, for some people, a morning coffee can be enough to stop them from sleeping or impair their sleep at night. Mm -hmm. We talked about alcohol consumption. Any alcohol, even just one drink, does reduce your deep quality sleep and affect your sleep quality. So again, going back to that with breast cancer, but just back onto caffeine, it also reduces adenosine. So caffeine blocks adenosine, which we talk about melatonin, but adenosine is one of our relaxation neurotransmitters that actually increases over the day and is actually really important for helping us sleep. And if you're Mm. sensitive or you've got reduced adenosine due to stressors in your life or you're sensitive to caffeine, you could be actually reducing your one of your major relaxation neurotransmitters and just that one cup a day can make a big difference. So it's yeah. those common things that have snuck into our everyday life that if we can just make some changes, which I know it's not easy. It's telling people, try going without caffeine, try going without alcohol. It's not easy, but it can have a huge impact. Mm, absolutely. And you mentioned lifestyle and emotional factors across the board are really important not only for our everyday health and how we feel in the moment, but also for long-term prevention. And there's a particular combination of emotional stress and breast cancer. Tell us about the research that shows that there is a strong link between emotional stress and breast cancer and what do we do about that? Yeah, well, it's just really interesting. They've done some studies, for example, in mothers of autistic children, and Mm. they've found that there's actually an increased risk of breast cancer in this population. And when we look at it, you know, this can be various factors, including genetic factors and how we metabolise toxins, but also the emotional stress of having a child with high needs. So it's it's Mm. hard to pick out 
what is the exact mechanism, and it's probably multiple mechanisms. But the other thing that people who work in the emotional space with cancer have found, particularly in breast cancer, that there is a frightening correlation with intimate relationship difficulty in either a dominant relationship or, mm. like, for example, your, your spouse or your boss, but also trauma such as losing a child. Yeah. And so like looking at those stress factors and stress management and emotional stress and even just being open to the discussion around it, because I think people in those particular environments can can either normalise their situation and kind of minimise it, or they actually don't recognise that the situation that they're in is actually impacting their health long term. Mm, so, absolutely. And that's mm. where... You know, another screening thing I'll do with patients when they come in is is look at that, look at traumas, look at ongoing stressors. And we've got some amazing techniques that are being used now in the field, like, for example, with EMDR, which is a form of trauma release. But there's there's other types of trauma release. Mm. There's also some evidence that's being done through Bond University around um, uh, tapping, emotional mm. tapping. So there's a lot of things that we can try and do to support women, even if they've got ongoing, uh, they can't get rid of certain stressors, but to help them release that trauma in an ongoing way. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Dr. Nicole, thank you so much for being with us today to discuss breast cancer prevention. It's such an important issue. And I think we need to, to look as a community beyond just that simple early detection and really feel much more empowered particularly about the evidence-based opportunities we have to support, you know, the women of our community long-term, especially consider, considering this, you know, toxic load and the ubiquitous, you know, environmental exposure that we're all experiencing. So I really want to thank you for coming on the show today. Mm, well, thank you for having me. And I really hope that there's been something there that uh, women can feel empowered and that clinicians can feel empowered to educate their patients about to make a change. Thank you everyone for listening today. Don't forget that you can find all the show notes, transcripts and other resources from today's episode on the FX Medicine website. I'm Dr. Michelle Woolhouse and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only, and it is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to FX Medicine, and share us with your family, friends, and colleagues. 